thou, Jezeron, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another will subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I have appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come and let them and let uh, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word and its truth for our life. And Lord, I pray that you would give us some truths to help us, to guide us, to direct us. Lord, help us to make good decisions for you this morning. And may your word be glorified in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, give me the words to say and the boldness and the strength to say it. And again, Lord, I pray your blessing upon every aspect of our service and the preaching of your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God is looking for one who will seek him with all of their heart. I understand this morning that there are many things that are calling for our attention. Many things that are wanting us to follow after or to seek after. And yet the promise in the Bible is that when we seek the Lord, we will find him. If we knock, the door will be opened unto us. What does it truly mean to seek the Lord? We use that expression, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. What does it mean to seek the Lord? Well, to seek the Lord means to have a personal relationship with him. To seek the Lord is to have a personal relationship with him. In Psalm 63, verse 1, the psalmist said, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. O God, thou art my God. Notice that personal statement, thou art my God. The psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. To seek the Lord is to have a personal relationship with him. To seek the Lord is to desire more from him. The Bible says in our text here in Psalm 63, it says, My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. Uh, in the book, A.W. Tozer's book, uh, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer writes these words. He says, Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. They mourned for him, they prayed and wrestled and sought for him day and night, in season and out. And when they had found him, the findings was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. To seek God is to pursue him, to fill the vacuum in our life. It's easy to fill our life with other things, with pleasures and hobbies and all these things, but seeking after God means that we're going to fill that emptiness with the only one that can satisfy God himself. And in Psalm 63, David had lost so much in his life. He had lost his family. He had lost his material possessions. And yet he wasn't seeking after those things. He was seeking God and God alone. And, to, and so to seek the Lord is, is to seek God with all of our heart, that God would bring that satisfaction into our life. And I believe in Isaiah 44, the Bible gives us a special blessing and promise to those that seek after the Lord. God is describing his blessing on the righteous one. And God is illustrating Israel as that righteous individual. 
In fact, we notice in our text in chapter 44, it uses the name Jezerun. And the word, the name Jezerun means the upright one or the righteous one. And the name is only used three more times in the Old Testament. It's used in Deuteronomy 32.15 and Deuteronomy 33 verses 5 and verse 26. It's a name which has its foundation in grace. Because Israel had been, uh, was deep in sin, and yet God calls them the righteous one. God calls them the upright one, the beloved. And, and, and so it speaks of the grace of God in our life. And I believe it's a wonderful picture of the Christian life. We are sinners saved by the grace of God. And we are declared righteous by God himself because of the merits of Jesus Christ. And so this passage of scripture allows us to illustrate God's work in our life, his salvation in our life, and really the blessing and the promise of one that would seek God with all of their heart. And so let's notice, if we could, some wonderful truths about the righteous one, the upright one, and what God wants to do in our life if we seek the Lord with all of our heart. Number one, I want you to notice with me if you're taking notes this morning, number one, God is our satisfaction. God is our satisfaction. In verse three, the Bible says, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Listen, all of us today have needs. There's not a person here or a person listening to the live stream that doesn't have a need in their life, that doesn't have troubles or hurts or burdens or disappointments. And yet the promise of the Bible is that God in these difficult times and in these good times, God is the one that satisfies. God is the one that meets the needs in our heart. In fact, letter A in our notes this morning, God will satisfy the thirsty soul. God will satisfy the thirsty soul. The Bible says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, like water to the thirsty. God's word and God's truth satisfies the longing, thirsty soul. The righteous one, the upright one, seeks God with all of their heart as one that would seek water to quench their thirst. They're seeking the Lord. They're seeking God in this truth. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever had to, to drink water when you weren't thirsty. Uh, it's difficult to do. To eat food when you don't have an appetite. The old saying is a good meal begins with a good appetite. <laughs> You're hungry enough, you'll eat anything. <laughs> the reality is, is that God is comparing this with our spiritual pedigree. You want to measure your spiritual pedigree today? You want to, you want to look at your, your spiritual condition? Then ask yourself this question. Am I thirsty for the things of God? Or is my thirst somewhere else? When my kids were younger, well, not even younger, even now, they would come to the kitchen table. My wife would make a wonderful meal and sit on the table and and then they would say those dreaded words to my wife, I'm not hungry. And normally we understand that if they're not hungry at supper time, it means that they satisfied their hunger somewhere else. And so we look for some candy wrappers that may be lying around. At the end of the day, if a Christian's not thirsty for God, it means that they're quenching their thirst in things that are not going to satisfy they're seeking things that are not going to last. They're seeking things that are not going to meet the needs of their life. And so the Bible says, no, the upright one will find their satisfaction in God. In God. And God will satisfy the thirsty soul. How is your appetite for the word of God today? You know, I've been a pastor here at Kitchener Baptist Church. I can't believe this for over 10 years. I've been, I've been at Kitchener Baptist Church for over 16 years. And uh, I appreciate the congregation uh, at Kitchener Baptist Church. I had the opportunity to preach in so many other churches uh, over my years. But one thing I know about Kitchener Baptist Church, and uh, most of the people love to hear the word of God. And they're hungry to hear the word of God. They, they're 
thirsty to hear the word of God. And you know, you, you are an easy people to preach to. When people are hungry for God's word and they want to grow and they want to learn and they want to hear the word of God, you know, they're not looking at the clock and saying, when is this guy going to be done anyway? Uh, no, they want to know what God has to say. And they're thirsty to seek the face of God. God, I want you to tell me something I need to know today. I, I want you to give me help for my life. When, when you seek the face of God, you, you look to the Lord and find that satisfaction. God says, if you're thirsty, I'll satisfy you. I'll satisfy you. The hymn writer said, all my life long, I have panted for a drought from some cool spring that I hope would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within, hallelujah, I found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his life I now am saved. The Bible teaches us that God will give and satisfy the thirsty, give water to the thirsty. But secondly, if you're taking notes, letter B, God will give us his spirit. God will give us his spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to specific people for specific purposes. You know the story in the book of Judges in chapter 16 of Samson. When Samson was confronted with the Philistines, the Bible says that he, he got up to fight and he did not even know that the Lord was departed from him, that God had taken away his spirit. We think of the story of David when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan in Psalm 51. We see his prayer to God, his prayer for God to wash his sins away, to make him whole again. And what does David say? David said, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because God had given his spirit to specific people for specific purposes. Now, this is why studying the Bible is important. Because as we transition into the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is given to those who put their faith and trust in, in Jesus. The moment you believe the gospel, put your faith and, and trust in the Lord, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. And, and we notice in our text here in verse number five, the Bible says, one will say, I am the Lord's. And, and, and there's a strong connection between a believer and the spirits indwelling in their life. In fact, John said in 1 John that if you have not the Holy Spirit, you are not one of his. A Christian has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in their life. And it's not you getting more of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit spirit getting more of you the holy spirit is a person the third person of the godhead and he indwells our life and the moment we trust jesus as our savior the holy spirit moves in and friend listen to me he makes himself known pretty quickly i always use the illustration if you know you have a, a man who marries a woman and the man's not very neat and tidy and you know the woman she's very neat and tidy she moves into that home she makes herself known pretty quickly and the holy spirit he makes him himself known pretty quickly as he looks at our life and he begins to work and and direct us and the bible says that as a child of god the holy spirit lives within us he indwells us in fact if we could turn in our bible uh, to ephesians chapter 1 i want you to notice this text with me ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12 ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12 the Bible says this, verse 12, that, ye, uh, that we should uh, be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and whom also after that ye believed. So the gospel was preached and someone believed the gospel and notice what happens in the moment that they believe the gospel, the Bible says ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And the idea there of seal is the idea of a king. In Bible days, he would have a ring, and that ring, that signet ring, he would use to, to seal a message. And that message would show that it was 
from the king, that it belonged to the king. And, and the Bible says that the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus and believe the gospel, that we have that seal upon us, that we belong to God, and that seal is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says this, it says in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And the word earnest there is the idea of a down payment, that God is going to finish his redemptive work in our life and, and to show that that work will be done. He has given us a down payment, his own spirit to indwell us and to guide us and to lead us. When we purchased our piano, uh, new to us, not brand new, but new to us, we went to uh, the store and we gave them a down payment. And that down payment was to show that we are going to finish the transaction and the Bible says when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he gave us a down payment to show that he would finish his redemptive work. And that down payment is the Holy Spirit. And he indwells each of us. He, he comforts us. He comforts us. And he reminds us of truth and brings to our memory God's word and God's principles and and when we come in our life to a difficulty and we pray to our Heavenly Father and we don't even know the words to say, we can't even utter out the words because our heart is so broken and so burdened, we can't even get the words out of our mouth. The Holy Spirit takes over and he prays on our behalf. He is on our side. Jesus said, I'm going away. But I'll send to you another comforter. The word there, another, is another of the same. He will come to you. He will guide you. He will help you. And so we find that, that Jesus has given us a comforter. Why? Because we need comfort in this world of crisis to guide us and to lead us. And of course, this passage of Scripture is speaking contextually of Israel and how God's Spirit would be upon this people and lead these people, but also prophetically of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon believers in this age as we uh, strive to seek the Lord with all of our heart. Not only is God our satisfaction, but number two, would you write this down? God is our stability. God is our stability. You know, the Bible makes many declarations of truth. In fact, when we open the Bible, the very first verse we read, in the beginning, God, is a declaration that we have a creator God who made all things. And you're going to have a difficult time. You're going to have a difficult time believing the rest of the Bible if you can't believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You're, you're going to have to make a choice. Is this truth? Will I accept it as truth? It's God's declaration. Or will I live my life and believe a lie? And so we find in, in Isaiah 44 another declaration. The Bible says there is only one God. There is only one God. In verse 8, the Bible says God has declared it. There is only one God. Besides him, there is no other. Now I understand this morning that this is divisive to many especially living in a world that doesn't believe in absolute truth. I mean, we want to live in a world today, the world wants to live in a, in a world that, where everyone is right, and everyone has their own truth, and they can just follow their own truth, and it's, it's going to lead us to the, all to the same place. But this is not God's declaration. There is only one God, he says. And to believe a lie... To follow the advice of the world is to bring, listen to me, instability into your life. To know what is true, to know what is right, to know the declarations of God is to place your feet on a solid rock and to know what is right and to know what is wrong. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. What brings stability into your life is setting your feet upon a rock and trusting the God of the Bible. You see, letter A, trusting in a lie brings instability. Now, in our text here, in verses 9 to 11, the Bible is really laying out for us the instability within Israel in, in believing and trusting in idols. 
He says here that idols are created by men. They're formed from, uh, formed from wood. And, and trusting in these idols are not going to help you. He said they see not and they know not. And, and I understand today that in our society it's not as much as idols on the shelf as idols on the, on the, in the self. And we have placed in our life things that we are looking to and seeking after more than God. And I want to remind you this morning that money cannot give you wisdom. And pleasure isn't going to guide you in the right direction in your life. All of these things are unprofitable. In fact, in verse 11, we notice that the Bible says that the creators of idols are men. And he says, why would you hope in that which is created by man? Why, why would you put your faith and trust in things that will not last that they don't have any profit for your life that cannot help you. I'm glad today that my salvation is not built upon that which man has created, but that which is founded in God, the eternal God. I want us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Would you turn there with me, 1 Peter chapter 1, and turn with me uh, in verse number 18, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. Hold your place in Isaiah 44 this morning. And notice what the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, uh, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Our salvation is not founded upon the tradition of men. Our salvation is founded upon the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we can trust God today. We can have that stability to know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we can trust God today with our eternal soul, wiser than men and faithful and true to the end. Friend, listen to me. Don't be deceived to put your trust in anything else. Now, what's interesting in verse 13, the Bible kind of lays out the idea of idolatry. And, and, and it shows us how silly it is, how, how crazy it is that they would put their faith and trust in something made of wood. He says, verse 13, the idols that are created, they're, they're created by carpenters. And the carpenter goes to the forest and he looks for a tree and he chops down that tree. And then he carves it into an idol. And, and, and what does he take, what does he do with the remainder of that idol? He throws it into the fire. And he uses it to heat his home or he uses it to cook a meal. And God is saying, those ashes are your idol. They, it cannot help you. It cannot direct your life. It doesn't know anything about you. Why would you put your trust in these things? In verse 20, he says, you have a deceived heart. He said, you're holding this idol in your right hand. He says, you are not, you are holding a lie in your right hand to trust in this idol. This idol can't help you. By the way, the right hand in the Bible speaks of strength. And here, the children of Israel were trying to find their strength and help from this lie. And they were being deceived. Isn't it a terrible thing to be deceived? It's a terrible thing to be deceived. Isn't it a terrible thing to think that you have something when you really don't. I remember one time I was studying for a test and I studied as hard as, probably not as hard as I should have, but I studied. So that's, that's a plus. And I remember I, I knew for sure, I knew I was gonna ace this test. I was gonna get 100. I wrote the test and I was excited to get this test back because I knew I did well. I knew in my heart I did well. I get the test back, I got an F. That's disappointing, isn't it? How many people are going to be disappointed who live in this life who think they're going to heaven? More so, to think they're going to heaven, and yet they're following a lie. And they're deceived. And God says, don't be deceived. Don't trust in anything. I am the true God. I am the one that brings stability in your life. Letter B, God's truth brings stability into our life. Let me give you a couple of uh, thoughts here. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock. Rock. That's how the Bible describes 
the stability that is found in the Lord. He is a rock. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? You know, the Apostle Paul knew what it was like to be broke and he knew what it was like to have, you know, material gain. And he says, listen, I know how to have much and I know how to suffer need. And yet none of these changes in the circumstances of his life, he said, none of these things move me because he says, I know whom I have believed, not what I have believed. I haven't put my trust in money. I haven't put my trust in the wisdom of this world. When all these things are taken from me, no, my feet is still planted on the rock. Because my stability doesn't come from a changing world. It comes from an unchanging God. And that's when we put our faith and trust in our life. God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. God can always be trusted. His promises bring peace in the storm. His promises guides and directs us to run our race for his glory. And when our race is done... He calls us to glory, to be with him for all eternity. Friend, listen to me. God is our satisfaction. God is our stability. But thirdly, would you write it down? God is our our Savior. God is our Savior. He says, I will satisfy you. I will bring stability in your life. But also, he says to Judah, I will deliver you. And to prove his power and work in their life, he had prophesied in Isaiah 44 of his future deliverance from the Babylonians. God said, I will come to you and I will deliver you. We notice in our text, letter A, first of all, he is our creator. Now remember, we're illustrating this as talking to the righteous one or the the, the one who is seeking after God. And, And so we're looking at a believer here, one who has put their faith and trust in the Lord. And we understand that he is our creator. He says here in our text, I have formed thee. And we remember God's purpose in our life to have a relationship with him. But not only in a physical sense are we created by God, but also in a spiritual sense, we are new creations. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And we think of God's eternal work on Calvary to make us a new creation. And now we have become a servant of Christ, not a servant of sin, not a servant of ourselves. But we have become a servant of Christ to give our life to him. And so he has created us in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. But let her be also he has shown his grace. Verse 22, he says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. He has washed our sins away and they are many. They are many. He has washed them all away. That thick cloud of our sin that has separated us from God, he has redeemed us. He has has bought us back so that we could have a relationship with him again. And this is only accomplished not by our own work and merit. This is accomplished by the grace of Almighty God. He has shown favor upon us and we can have eternal life because of his work his redemptive work in our life. But also let her see, he has worked in our life, verse 23. The Bible says, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. And that was God's work. All of the laws and restrictions and All of these things were for the heathen nations to see God in Israel. That they served and worshipped the true God. And that all of their idolatry was unprofitable. That Israel served the true God. And God is at work in our life today. In 2022, God's going to begin to chip away those pieces in your life. So that others can see Jesus in you. 
I love the testimony of the Apostle Paul. I, I really don't understand, I, I really don't think we understand the gravity of the situation when the Apostle Paul became a Christian. And when the Lord had directed Paul to be a part of that church, first church service, all of the believers gathered together and said, are we sure that he's a Christian? <laughs> I heard about this man. He's trouble. And yet the Bible says, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, he said, listen, God had done a work in my life. How God had changed me from a murderer to a missionary. God had began to chip away those pieces from my life. And I love what he says in Galatians 1 verse 24. He says, and they, the church, glorified God in me. And that's what we want in 2022. We want others to see God in us. We want others to say, I don't understand how they can do that. I don't understand how they could keep on going on with, with losing a loved one like that. I don't understand how they could have the strength to take another breath and to live another day. But I know this, the God that they serve must be real. And he must give real comfort. And he must give real direction. And they glorify God in me. That's what we want. And that's what God wants to do in your life today. He doesn't want the world to see you anymore. He wants the world to see Jesus in all of his glory. God's working in our life today so that Christ can be glorified in us. And he brings troubles and trials in our life, not to break us, but that others can see Jesus. And that is why we must lift him up, friend. If I be lifted up, Jesus said, I will draw all men unto myself. That's why we must lift up Jesus. Jesus must be lifted high in our world today. In Isaiah 44, verse 24, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, and stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by himself, by myself that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh the excuse me and maketh diviners mad and turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. God was at work in Judah. God was at work so that these ungodly nations would see the true God in them. God had a plan and a purpose. And God has a plan and a purpose in your life as well. Listen. God help the world to see a God of wisdom in us. Amen? God help the world to see a God of comfort in us. God help the world to see a God who, who delights in the impossible in our life. A God of strength. The world doesn't need to see more of the same. They don't need to see you. <laughs> they need to see Jesus. They need to see Jesus. And lastly, letter D, he brings victory to his people. God will bring victory to Judah, who would be in exile, you know, to show them that he's in control of all of it. In fact, he mentions a name. The name is Cyprus. Who is this? What's the significance? Well, God will raise up Cyprus to overcome the Babylonians and to eventually free his people. And God said he would be a shepherd to me. I will lead him and direct him, and he will lead my people. In fact, God says he, he will defeat the Babylonians, he will rebuild Jerusalem, and he will lay the very foundation for the temple. Wow, our God knows what he's doing. <laughs> we don't have a clue what's happening in our world today. But God does, and he's in control, and we can trust in him. Why would you trust in the ashes of this world when you can trust in the God who brings stability to our life. Don't be deceived today. Nothing this world could ever bring stability into your life. You know, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, then, then nothing I'm saying makes sense to you. I'm talking about the upright one. Huh? I'm talking about the righteous one in Christ who has placed their faith in Jesus. And, and today, if, if this doesn't make sense to you, it's because, first of all, your journey begins with God by realizing your condition and turning to Jesus and him alone for your salvation. 
And when you do, you become the Jezeron. You become the upright one. You, you become the righteous one by his grace. And he shows you that satisfaction. And he brings stability in your life. And he is your savior, your deliverer. He created us. He delivered us. He has shown us his wonderful grace. And he's constantly working in our life. And eventually, when everything is said and done, when our race is run, he brings the final victory. And he brings us to heaven to be with him. And so will we ever be with the Lord. What a wonderful Savior we serve. Fully trust in him, friend, in 2022. Fully trust in him. Don't let anything else become your pursuit. Seek God with all of your heart. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for its direction in our life. And Lord, I pray you would help us in this new year to seek you with our heart. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. I pray if there's an individual listening to the message that is not a Christian, is not saved, I pray that they'll put their faith and trust in you even today. And Lord, I pray you would help each child of God, the upright ones, the righteous ones, to seek you to seek you with all of our heart and help us not to be deceived by the alluring of the world. But Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books together. Can we to 204 will be our benediction. 204, when you find it, let's stand together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. I'll lead you on that first verse, 204. Let's sing it together. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And light bless you seek the lord with all of your heart in this year i know this the promise of the bible is if you seek him you're going to find him amen tonight at six o'clock we'll meet together hope you can be a part of that service god bless you you are dismissed hey it's pastor burns again thank you so much for watching our live stream today before you leave i want to ask you an important question you know i believe anytime you hear the word of god it brings us to a place of decision you have to decide, are you going to listen to God or are you going to ignore what he has to say for our life? Now, the greatest decision that you could ever make is to know for sure that heaven is your eternal home. The Bible teaches us that we have all sinned against God. There is none righteous, no, not one. 
all of us are separated from him. And because of that, one day we will die. The Bible says that after death will come the judgment. And we want to make sure